welcome to Vision City Church on this Vision Sunday. We just called Vision Sunday Vision Sunday because it was the anniversary, our, our, our birth date, and it was one of those things where we wanted to uh, we wanted to cast vision for the for the new year and where we wanted to celebrate how God has been so faithful to us and he really, really has. Uh, for those of you that have been with us along this journey, you know it's been quite the experience. Uh, we've had a lot of different firsts, uh, a lot of things that the Lord has just blessed us so abundantly with. And most importantly, it's been you guys, the relationships that we've been able to establish with you, uh, with your family, with your children. And and what a, an amazing family I think we have become. As, as Ryan announced, you know, we are a church family. Uh, we have walked uh, with each other these past seven years through the highs, through the lows, uh, through difficulties, through blessings, uh, through losing loved ones and, and birthing new ones. And we are just so, so blessed by what the Lord has done in his church. And we're so thankful that you've been a part of it. Again, if it is your first time to our church today, we just want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we've really come to a place where we're ready to move forward. And I think that sometimes we can get stuck in the past. We can get stuck in, you know, maybe uh, problems that we may have had or difficulties we may have experienced. And I think it's time for us to be able to move forward and to really turn the corner and step into all that God has called us to be a part of. Uh, we last week talked about you know, really, and I, I'm going to just file it in the past, but and we'll talk about this in a moment, but we just talked about the faithfulness of God and how, you know, it's time for us to move forward and not be stuck in the past. I wanted to make a couple announcements uh, before we get into our teaching uh, portion of this morning. Uh, we have, as Ryan mentioned, we have some great ministries that are going to be kicking off. For those of you that have signed up and have yet to receive an email, uh, the way that we are planning to roll out the new things that are going to be happening, and in some cases, it's going to be a rebuilding. I feel it's almost like with what we're doing now as a church, it's very uh, akin to Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, there have been some things that have been broken down and things that were outside of our control that we're going to be rebuilding and strengthening and making better than new. But if you've... If you've yet to receive an email, just know that the plan is to roll out all these things in the month of February. We're turning the corner on the new year, and then in February is when you're going to start to see all of these things go into effect. Namely being the new ministries that we're going to be starting up again, as were mentioned, security and ushers. Um, women's ministry, Ruth will be out here next Sunday to uh, give you an update on what's happening with the women's ministry. I know a lot of you ladies are excited for that, as well as we're going to be rolling out our new men's ministry and what's going to be taking place uh, with the men. Uh, really kind of on the top of the list for us is our children's ministry. Uh, starting in the month of February, we're going to be providing children's ministry through sixth grade. And we're going to be setting up some outdoor venues uh, around the campus here that we're going to be able to use for our children's classes. And it's going to be great to be able to, for you as parents who have been kind of, you know, uh, on parent duty at the same time trying to catch a message. It can be very challenging. I know I have four children. I know what that's like. It's going to be nice to be able to have somebody to oversee uh, the children in their appropriate ages. And so I'm really happy to announce that in February, uh, we're going to be rolling out our children's ministry with our outdoor venues, little pop tents that we're going to be setting up. And then they're going to be having a lesson at their appropriate age. And then they'll be able to have some supervision as they uh, are able to play outside afterwards. And so if you have served in the children's ministry in the past, uh, you're going to be receiving an email uh, this week that will give you uh, just some info about what is going to be taking place with the, the new children's ministry that's going to be happening. And um, just so that you know, uh, one of the things that we are looking at doing with the children's ministry, which is one of really the three foundational pillars of, of a church. Now, our mission statement is to teach the word 
to equip the saints to preach the gospel, knowing that Jesus builds his church. Part of the foundational pillars of accomplishing that mission statement are through worship and through the teaching of God's word and through children's ministry. And then from that, we'll branch out. But we are going to be changing something with our children's ministry. And I'm happy to to be the first to announce to you uh, that we are going to be uh, implementing a brand new children's ministry that we are entitling GROW. Uh, Now, this is going to be an acronym for giving, reading, outreach, and worship. Giving, reading, outreach, and worship. And In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we have a very, very interesting passage. And this is what we're really excited about to be able to share with you because we have a lot of families uh, with children. We have a lot of families uh, that are looking for things for their children to be a part of. But in Ephesians 4, it says this, So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And as you realize what's happening in our world, our children are often the target of indoctrination. Our children are the target of exploitation. We are, our children are constantly being attacked as they are the next generation that are coming up in our country. And so we realize that there is a lot of cunning of the devil trying to attack children and to uh, really jade them at an early age. And so our job as parents uh, to protect them, to be involved with their lives, to know what they're, what they're up to in their school and, and to have those lines of communication and most importantly, raising them and training them up in the way that they should go that, so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. We have decided uh, to implement really what it says in Ephesians, no longer being children tossed to and fro, but... Our goal as a church and for our children's ministry starting in 2021, it says in Ephesians 4, that latter part, it says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that, so that it builds itself up in love. And we couldn't help but notice the glaringly powerful word, grow. And as we see our children growing physically, emotionally, mentally, we want to see them grow spiritually as well. And so we want to teach our children as that acronym GROW stands for giving and reading, outreach and worship. We want to teach our kids how to give of themselves as God has given for them. Living in California, living in the United States of America, our children are very blessed. Sometimes we need to have them a little unblessed, you know, in regards to certain things so that they might be thankful. And one of the greatest things we can do with our children is to teach them how to be giving. The next word is reading. And we want to encourage the reading of God's word through an actual Bible that our children would know and be very familiar with God's word, that they'd be able to know the books of the Bible, know what is being taught there, and that they might be able to stand on their own two feet spiritually. And so there's going to be an emphasis on the teaching of God's word in these very fun uh, classes that we have for our children. Next and thirdly, we see that we want our really our youth ministry, our children's ministry to provide means for outreach to their friends, family, and community. And for those of you that attended our Christmas Eve service, a lot of you brought your family members with you and friends that didn't live in the area and that quite frankly, some that didn't go uh, to church at all. But your children were involved in communicating the gospel through those uh, special uh, things that you saw on the Jumbotron. The children speaking the truth of the Christmas story, encouraging those that were listening. And that's part of outreach to the community. And so we're going to be developing ways for our children and our youth ministry to reach outside of their box. And and really help them step into the gifts that God has called them uh, to utilize. And then lastly, we want to inspire our children to live lives of worship unto the Lord. So giving, reading, outreach, and worship. And there is nothing more, I think, pleasing to the Lord than when his children worship him. 
And when there are little children, our kids, singing praises to the Lord and worshiping God, I don't think that there is a sweeter thing. I don't think that there is anything that blesses the Lord's heart more than that. And so in a church community where maybe singing is something that most may not participate in, we really want to train our children to be worshipers unto the Lord, not just with their voice, but by the way that they live their lives. And so I want to encourage you uh, families with young kids who have been hanging on saying, I don't know how much more I can keep my kids occupied with crayons and toys. And, you know, I'm trying to listen to church and they're running around on the, on the playground. We want you to know that beginning in February, we have been given fresh vision for our children's ministry. And the Vision 2.0 is going to be launching something extremely powerful for all of our kids. And we hope that you can be a part of that. So uh, that is a, a huge announcement for us moving forward into the new year. We're not looking back. We're stepping out and doing the new things that God has called us to do. Now, a part of what happens with our church in regards to leadership, whether it's house groups or whether it's praying for you after service or giving you godly counsel, we've been very blessed with some men that the Lord has raised up uh, to be able to participate in serving you, serving the body of Christ. In Acts, the Bible talks about, as the apostles were looking for men, the criteria for these men to serve was that they had to be men that were filled with the Holy Spirit, men that had good reputations and men that exercised wisdom. And over the course of these seven years, we've seen a handful of guys be raised up. And I know even looking out at this audience here today, there are many of you that fit that bill. And I'm hoping that the Lord touches your heart to be involved in serving because there's really no greater uh, privilege than to be able to serve the Lord with our gifts and with our talents. And so I'd like to invite the guys to come up to the front of the stage. We have David Consani and Ryan Easter, Jonathan Lim and Steven Sanchez. If you guys would just make your way up and kind of spread out right here in the front, I'd like to introduce you uh, to the guys that I lean upon, guys that pray for you regularly and guys that are here to, to serve you as Vision City Church. Uh, we've been blessed with some real dynamite guys that I've called friends and have really uh, done a great job over the years serving and being a part of this church. On my right and your left, we have David Consani. I'm just going to introduce you and we'll go down, go down the list here. Uh, David Consani and his wife Kim have just been a blessing to this church and leading house groups, overseeing our ushers and our greeters. And we want to introduce you uh, to them today. So David Consani, is on our far right, your left. Next to him is uh, Jonathan Lim. Uh, Jonathan Lim and his wife, Marianne, even his, his daughter, uh, Jennifer, and have been involved with our, our church since day one, even pre-Vision uh, City Church, when uh, Jonathan was at the School of Ministry at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, when I was uh, just starting out, he was studying there. And uh, just as a, a great heart for the Lord, Jonathan is actually one of our ordained pastors uh, through Calvary Chapel. So Jonathan uh, went through the School of Ministry and uh, has overseen our missions, has uh, led the Irvine Central house group, and he is going to be the one really that's been spearheaded a lot, spearheading a lot of the pastoral care, you know, giving you phone calls, checking in, seeing how you're doing, and so that's Jonathan Lim. Over here in the center is Ryan Easter. Ryan and his wife Elizabeth have led our Tustin house group and have been serving here faithfully for uh, really almost since the beginning. Their, their child, Kaya, who is uh, uh who <laughs> was our first baby born here at our, at our church. Uh, we used to joke about how the Lord added daily to the church those that were being saved and being born. And uh, we've been blessed by them. And Ryan oversees our men's ministry. And we're really happy to have Ryan a uh, part of our uh, leadership team. On my left and your far right, Steve Sanchez. Uh, many of you don't know this about Steve. And we're going to recognize this today. But Steve also uh, has been ordained through Calvary Chapel. And so Steve is actually a pastor through Calvary Chapel and uh, has pastored in different states and has served in different capacities. And uh, he has overseen our house groups. He has overseen our marriage ministry and uh, stepping in to, to help serve where is needed. And so we're recognizing Pastor Steve Sanchez today as part of our, our pastoral team. But I wanted to introduce you to our leadership, guys that are here to serve you. And you probably recognize many 
many of them, if not all of them, but uh, you'll see these guys spread out on Sunday mornings. Uh, you'll see them serving in different capacities, but they're really a great point of contact for you to be able to get more information about the church, uh, to receive prayer and counsel, and I want you to know these guys personally. These are great guys, and we're happy to have them be a part of our church again as we turn this new year into just a real great opportunity for the Lord to do great things. And so would you please join with me as we pray for these guys, and then I'll have a, just a couple more uh, things I'd like to share with you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, these men that you have used in such a great way. Lord, we know that we are sinners saved by grace. We're not perfect. We make mistakes, Lord. We need your grace. And we ask, Lord, for these guys that serve in their different capacities, Lord, that you would continue to empower them and strengthen them to do what you've called them to do. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done in the past. But, Lord, we let go of those things that are behind, and now we press forward to those things that are ahead. And we pray for these guys, their families, their children, their ministries, that you would bless them. And Lord, I pray for many like these guys, that those that are sitting in their chairs right now as part of the congregation, that you would stir up their hearts to be able to step forward into what you have called them to do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. So today, after service, as was announced earlier, yes, you can give them a round of applause. They, they do a great job. After service in the designated areas, uh, these are going to be guys that are going to be point men uh, for you to receive prayer in your section. As was mentioned, we have our general seating. We have our mask only seating. Uh, we have for those of you that are in your uh, cars for the drive-in section, you can head over to the info booth. Uh, but if you need prayer for anything after service, we'll have both men and women available to pray for you uh, as, as uh, the Lord leads. So please, please be in prayer for what is going on in our country, be in prayer for your church, and be as Isaiah said. When the Lord said, you know, who will, he, who will we send? Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. And I know that the greatest things that the Lord desires to do are yet ahead. And the Lord has sustained us. And even the number seven in the Bible has great significance as being really that number of the Lord, the number of perfection and completion. And yesterday in our leadership meeting, we were joking around about, Lord, please let that seventh year be the time where we've completed our training so that we might move forward into what the Lord has called us to do. Because we know that nothing happens uh, coincidentally. We know that everything is for a purpose. And we know that the Lord has walked with us these last seven years. And we're really excited to be able to say, look at the great things that God has done. Look at the foundation that he has laid because, you know, I have an uncle who's an architect. If you're involved in any kind of a, a construction or architecture, you know you always lay your foundation first. It goes deep and it goes wide and then you add the floors to it. And we've seen over the last seven years the Lord laying a sure foundation, deep and wide. And that not even COVID or, you know, government or anything can stop the work that the Lord has done. And we're very, very pleased to be able to see firsthand the Lord's faithfulness to his church and to witness the great work that he has done in your life. And I think that is really one of the most remarkable things that I get to witness every single day is you guys interacting with each other. Some of you met here at church, like you came, you were new, we were all new. And we came in and we met each other and we became family friends and we have been doing life together. And what a remarkable thing it is for me to look out at you guys and think, man, Lord, if it was not for you building your church, none of these friendships would be taking place. None of our children would be playing together. None of those that have given their life to Christ would have received Jesus. And what a great blessing it is to be a part of the new work that the Lord is doing. And so... Please continue to pray for your church. Continue to ask the Lord to pour out his spirit because we know that the best is yet to come. And the Lord has his hand upon you and upon this church. And we're excited to see the great things that the Lord is going to lead us into in 2021. If you have your Bibles, would you please open up to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to look at the first six verses of this passage of scripture today. Revelation chapter 3. And as you're turning there, in Revelation, 
And in particular, this chapter, we see Jesus communicating to different versions of the church. They were in different locations and they had different qualities and they had different symptoms of sinful decay. And they were to be a, an example for us as maybe what to do and what not to do. And often is the case when you look at stories in the Bible, you have a lot of things that are uh, described and a lot of things that are prescribed. You know, like, hey, this is a description of what not to do and this is a prescription of what you need to do. And in this particular section that we're going to be looking at, this is a church in Sardis. And I like to read verses one, actually. We'll just start off with verse one here where it says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God, the complete and fullness of the Holy Spirit, and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Now, I don't know if you saw this. I shared a video on Instagram. It was really just pouring out my heart about, you know, where we're at as a country, where we're at as a church. And then it was from a personal note because it was where I was at as a follower of Jesus and where my family is and where we're headed. And if you've not yet looked that up on Instagram or Facebook, please do so. But I've taken a hard look in the mirror. I've looked at my relationship with the Lord and what he's called me to do. And I know that it's not going to be easy. The seven years that we've experienced here at this church have been some of the most blessed and rewarded times of my life. It's also been some of the most challenging times of my life. You know, I think I've aged significantly these last seven years. I know that the white hairs have multiplied. You know, I'm still waiting for the wisdom to kick in, but the white hairs are waiting for it. And I remember starting out in this very, very venue, this location, I lived in the apartments right in front of these houses that are built here in Orchard Hills. It was 2013, and we drove back up Culver until it dead-ended, and it was absolutely barren up here. At that time, the real estate market had crashed, and all these homes that were supposed to be built had been put on hold. It was just dirt lot after dirt lot after dirt lot, and there was this school here right in the middle of Orchard Hills, the hill filled with orchards. And we drove by, And we thought to ourselves, me and Ruth, this would be a great place to plant a church. Little did we know that we would call the principal of the school, Rich Montgomery, and he was a believer. And he said, we would love to have you as a church here at our school. And he really rolled out the red carpet for us. And I was absolutely blown away as a church that was really just a group of people praying in a home. 18 or 19 of us would turn into something as amazing as this has been. Little did we know that some years after that, they would build all of these homes and all of these uh, uh, developments would start to come in around us. And we were in the middle of a massive housing explosion. The Lord seems to have a great way of knowing things that are going to happen before they're going to happen and putting you exactly where you need to be. And what a great thing it is to look back and see the faithfulness of the Lord and how he has provided for all of our needs. But it's not easy. Nobody ever said that following Jesus or doing what God had called you to do, has called you to do, was going to be easy. But really, when you think about it, what thing of any worth ever came through ease? I don't know anything of extreme value that comes through ease. So I've taken a very hard look in the mirror, looked at where the Lord has me and my family, what he's doing with this church, and then what's also happening in the United States of America and what is called, may I just even reference it as the so-called church as a whole. What I've seen is not good. Never would I have in my 
wildest imaginations of a kid growing up in Southern California imagined that what is described in Romans chapter one, where it says, and I'm, I'm going to read this to you, and it's nine verses, and it's kind of lengthy, and it's pretty intense. But in Romans chapter one, verses 24 through 32, it says, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use of natural use for what is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. Man, it's hard to even read that. But then the real kicker is verse 32 in Romans 1, where it says, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. What he's saying there is that there are those that know what is right and they know what is wrong. They know the righteous judgments of God. Whether you realize this or not, in the United States of America, every single individual has been given a God, what we'll call a God-given conscience. That innately within them, they can discern what is of God and what is not of God. That's why some of our non-Christian friends can say things such as, hey, I thought Christians weren't supposed to curse, or I thought Christians weren't supposed to do that, because they know. But the Bible tells us that there are those with the knowledge of the righteous judgments of God that even in knowing those things continue doing that which is against God, but it doesn't stop there. They promote and even push and approve those doing the same things. Like I said, never in my life would I have imagined that those that know the righteous judgment of God would not only practice such things as described in Romans, as I just read, but approve and condone those that practice such things, listen to this, in their church. In their church. From their church. From their stage, from their pulpit from their place of influence over social media, that they would approve and promote those things that are against God, knowing God's righteous judgment. We have professing Christians that are musicians, pastors, and politicians that approve of sexual immorality and abortion. They practice such things. They approve of their fellow practitioners, and they call themselves the church. This is a serious thing. These individuals and so-called churches are dead spiritually. And the church that we're reading of today in Revelation chapter 3 in Sardis is considered the dead church. When I see the things, and you'd have to be blind to not be aware of these things, yet it seems that there are many Christians that have buried their heads in the sand, but we cannot be like that. When I see things done in the name of Jesus in our country, I cannot think anything other than the church abroad, what is you know, typically called the church in America, is dead. They have a name that they're alive, 
They have popularity as if they're alive. They have funding for their works, but they're quite dead spiritually. You know, a little background to the church that we're studying today in Sardis. This is from history. Sardis was actually a very wealthy city. Very affluent. A lot of materialistic things happening. Materialism, possessions. Did you know actually in Sardis, according to history, that the very first coin was minted in Sardis? They were the city of modern money, if you will. Sardis was also known for its luxury and softness, as well as apathy and immorality. I found it fascinating that historically, this city where this church is representing a church that you do not want to be, it was known for its softness. It had everything but they were soft. Anything you could ask for, but they were soft. The people of Sardis, they loved pleasure. They loved ease. They loved luxury. The church there, because of the affluence and because of the funding and because of the people that lived there, it would appear that the church was firing on all cylinders. Look how big of a place they have. Look what they can do. Look what they own. A man who is a commentator by the name of Habner said this, and I quote, we are not to get the impression that Sardis was a defunct affair with the building a wreck, the members scattered, the pastor ready to resign. It was a busy church with meetings every night, committees galore, wheels within wheels, promotion and publicity, something going on all the time. It had a reputation of being a live, wide awake, going concern. End of quote. Interesting. All the bells and whistles, things going on all the time. But the church was dead. Jesus, the author of Revelation, as he's speaking to the church, Jesus saw right past all of those things that from an outsider's perspective would seem that the church was thriving. Man, they got it going on over here. They have everything that they need. In America, it's easy to see how the church has become soft. As it's been more concerned with ease and convenience and the luxury of what could be offered to them. Apathy has crept in to the American church as we sat, you know, sadly, idly by. As evil made its way through our communities and our country. We allowed evil to raise its ugly head raise itself to places of power and did nothing to stop it. But rather we had Christian rappers pounding the pavement so that the people would vote for a pastor politician who is for abortion. The church in America has a name, but it's dead. Yet, in spite of the decay that is crept into the church as a whole, there is a remnant of professing Christians a remnant of those with a true biblical worldview, a remnant of that which would be called the overarching church. There is a remnant within that fear the Lord. And this is the true church. Those that have not bowed to political correctness, that have not bowed to social norms, that have not allowed society to dictate the morality, the guidelines, what's truth and not truth. There is a group, a remnant that remains. So Jesus, writing to this church, 
I believe he could be writing to our country with those that are like, hey, I was born in the United States of America. I'm a Christian. Or I attend church. I'm a Christian. There are many in our country that profess Christianity, but they lack the Christ likeness their profession requires to substantiate that profession. They don't know God's word. They're more influenced by pop culture. They're more pressured by social norms. They have the fear of man because they're more concerned with what others may say of them or how they might be treated. If they stand up for what they believe to be true, which is found in God's word. We're seeing censorship like we've never seen before. Things that you would think happen in North Korea and China. In other communist countries. We're seeing this move to absolutely quench and silence anything that has any semblance of morality or a biblical worldview. And there are people in the church across this entire country who have caved to such things. You know, years ago, and for those of you that have a Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa background, my pastor used to joke all the time, and it was more of a joke, but I think maybe it was was more real than you might think it to be at that time. He would say things such as, you know, there's a move to silence the church. There's a move to remove certain things that would be deemed offensive or hateful from the Bible. And there's a pressure upon pastors to no longer teach the true word of God. They're even threatening arrest and imprisonment. And then he would pause for a moment as he was known to do so. And he'd look down at his podium and sometimes he'd just start scratching his hand just like this. In the dead silence. And without breaking a smile, he would say, Please, please. Don't forget me when I'm in prison for teaching you the whole counsel of God. And people would laugh like, oh yeah, Chuck, that's funny, you know. He was dead serious. We as a church thought, you know, what would be the chances of that? Being imprisoned or shut down or silenced because you're teaching people the Bible in the U.S. of A. But might I just echo that? Please don't forget me. Because I have no plan of ever stopping teaching you the whole counsel of God's word. I don't, I just want you to know that as your pastor. The church needs to, like never before, know what it believes and stand upon those things they know to be true. To not compromise. To not give in. To stand your ground. Jesus said, a servant's not greater than his master. If they hated me, they'll hate you also. Such hate and vitriol towards Christianity, towards the church, towards anything that has to do with God's creation and the way it was planned out to be lived out. So Jesus instructs the church in verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. The first thing in verse 2 is this is a very hard thing to hear as a church. No doubt receiving these types of instructions and really just this rude awakening to a very bad spiritual state. The first thing we see that Jesus instructs the church in Sardis to do is to watch and to strengthen. Watch for what? For the return of Christ. Be ready for his return. And secondly, in light of the imminent return of Christ, strengthen that which remains. Now listen, don't take offense to the things that I'm saying about the spiritual condition of what is commonly referred to as the church in America. There are many churches 
and their pastors doing the very thing that is being described of here to strengthen their body, their flock, their church with the word of God to watch for the return of Christ, even as this church is doing this very moment on this Sunday. The Lord has reserved a remnant And throughout history, we've always seen that when evil has arose, there was a group that remained faithful to the Lord. That the Lord didn't need numbers. Jonathan, you remember King Saul's son and his armor bearer, he said something so profound when he was going to step out in faith to fight the enemies of the Lord, which in this particular story were the Philistines. And Jonathan said this very profound thing. And he said, it is nothing for the Lord to save with many or with few. Nothing for the Lord to save with many or with few. And though the churches that are faithful to teaching the word of God, and we have many great churches even in our own area, that are still remaining faithful, they are a small percentage of what is taking place across our country. We are not a majority, we are a minority when it comes to being involved with the church that stands upon what God's word says and encourages the church members to live holy before the Lord. So Jesus says, strengthen that which remains and watch for my return. So for us, though what may be called, let's just say, quote unquote, the church is an inflated view of the true church. There is a remnant of churches that are teaching God's word, that are equipping the saints, that are preaching the gospel, that are preaching the gospel, the unadulterated gospel, knowing that Jesus builds his church and they are anticipating Jesus return. They are participating in the work of the ministry. And the condition of the church, as I use that term loosely, the church at large may be bad. It's not without hope. It's not without hope. We are never without hope as followers of Jesus. And quite frankly, We have spent enough of our life talking about how awful last year was. It is time to move forward. It is time to step into the new things that God wants to do in your life. It's time to take steps outside of your comfort zone. It's time for you as moms and dads, husbands and wives, to strengthen that which remains. Often we are so upset or we're so concerned about what we don't have that we ignore the responsibility of what we do have. You can't control those things out there. But you do have control of what you're going to do with your time and with your resources. What you're going to do with the life that is so precious that God has given you. That you might take that verse that talks about God saving with many or with few. It doesn't have to be large. It doesn't have to be magnificent. It just needs to be something that you're faithful with as a good steward. Saying, Lord, you've entrusted me with this and I want to do the best that I can with what you've entrusted me with. That's honoring the Lord. That's being a faithful servant. That's being obedient to his call upon your life. So yes, you look at our country, a lot to be hopeless about, but we are not without hope as the church. And if you have found yourself so focused on the things of our country and the things of this world that you have lost hope, then it's time to refocus your attention upon our living hope. His name is Jesus Christ. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So step into those things that God has called you to do. Be bold, be courageous. The Lord your God is with you wherever you shall go. This year is the year 
We are going to push forward. We are going to reach out and we are not going to be limited by anything for God is not limited by anything on this earth. So we will not project our limitations upon almighty God. Jesus told the church to strengthen that which remains. They weren't to worry about what they did not have, but to refocus their efforts upon stewarding what they've been entrusted with. Maybe on a personal note today, you feel like maybe you're someone on the micro level that might have the appearance of being all good, but your heart needs to recommit to your former state of following Jesus. I know, as I said, I said, I told you guys, took a hard look in the mirror. We realize that we're sinners saved by grace, but we do not want to be those that have an appearance of faith, but nothing genuine about that. I don't want to have a veneer. I want to be the real deal. The Lord in his kindness and his goodness and faithfulness has allowed us to go through the things that we have gone through. And there has been a great refining that has taken place in the church and a great separation of the wheat from the chaff. Those who truly follow the Lord and those that truly do not. And it is not going to get any easier moving forward. But that's nothing for you to be fearful of. It doesn't matter if the world is going this way as long as you stay your course. The Lord will protect you. The Lord will provide for you. The Lord will buffer you. The Lord will cover you with his grace. When you stand before God, it's going to be about your character. What you did when no one was looking. What you did when it was hard. What you did when there was opposition. What you did when it wasn't easy. Sardis, this church that had the appearance of being alive, they were soft. They had luxury. They had ease. They had affluence. They had nice things. But they were dead spiritually. The difficulties and persecutions that arise from following Jesus aid us in not becoming apathetic. The difficulties you've experienced and the things that you thought, oh, this is going to break me, man. I don't think I'm going to make it through this. This is too hard. It actually helped you not be soft. It actually strengthened you. It further equipped you. It refined you as you felt like you were getting beat down. It was just the iron heated up and folded on top of itself and folded on top of itself and then heated up again. And so when that sword comes out, it's in, it's unbreakable. That's you. As the Lord has worked through your difficulties and your trials. The love of pleasure, ease, and compromise crippled the church in Sardis. But Jesus provides the remedy for such things. Remember, therefore, verse 3, how you received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. He just says, go back to the place of receiving the gospel, where you had that newfound desire to please the Lord and to turn from sin. Go back to the place where it cost you something as you sanctified yourself to do what was right and even difficult. Go back to the place where your commitment to Jesus spurred you to the place of doing that which was outside your area of comfort. He says, hold fast, repent of your sin. In verse four, it says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. There are a few churches And there are a few, as I said, small percentage of what is called the church nowadays that have not defiled themselves, that still teach the word of God. There are few in relation to the mass calling themselves the church that have a really close walk with the Lord. If you walk with Jesus on this earth from what we've just read, Jesus will be walking with you after this is all over. I don't know if you've caught that. It says in verse four, a few have not defiled themselves. They shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. 
In verse 5, it says, For he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. In verse 5 here, this word for overcomes in the Greek language actually means to conquer. Of Christians, it's to describe those that hold fast their faith even unto death against the power of their foes and temptations and persecutions. Being persecuted for doing what's right, you've conquered what? You've conquered compromise. You've conquered giving in. Even in some places, we've seen the explosion of strong, healthy churches in some of the most persecuted regions in the world. Some have even been put to death. Many of we've read about, we know of. Countless more that we have no clue ever existed, but Jesus does. They conquered even with their death. Here described, the book of life is a very interesting book because there is apparently, from what the scriptures tell us, a book of record that the Lord keeps of every person on the face of the earth. In Revelation 20, verse 12 and verse 15, it says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's happening at the end of all this. The book of life is the book you want your name found in. You do not want your name blotted out of that. And that's why in verse six, as we conclude our study this morning, it says, Jesus speaking, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So if you got an ear that works today, maybe even two, or maybe you need to turn your hearing aid up a little bit. Hear what the Lord has to say to the church. Following Jesus is going to grow increasingly unpopular in the near future. You're going to have to decide what you're going to do regardless of how difficult it may be. The church in America, because at the beginning we served the Lord and where our country was based upon biblical principles, we were blessed with not receiving persecution. We've grown soft. I think if our greatest difficulties as a church are meeting outside or not being able to have donuts or having to be in church into, you know, a little bit of the lunch hour. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 10, verse 20, and we'll just put a little letter B there because it's the second half of that verse. Jesus said, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Every one of you who have put your faith in Jesus, your name is written in that book of life and you can rejoice over that. Your name's written there. You know, what a blessing that is. Have you ever showed up to something that you registered for and they're like, oh, sorry, your name's not here. What are you talking about? I purchased tickets like six months ago. I have my confirmation email. What do you mean I'm not in it? Sorry, man, you're not on the list. Could you imagine breathing your last breath here and then standing before what's called the judgment seat of Christ or standing there as you give an account and they open the book and you're expecting to hear your name and it's not there? That's a tragedy because there's no going back and making up for it. So for us, we say, thank you, God, for saving us of our sins. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy, which I do not deserve. And Lord, help me to do what is right in your sight. Help me to hold the line. Help me to keep the faith. Help me to finish my race and to fight the good fight. In Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, it's me. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Didn't I have a mega church in your name and full funding in your name and, and all these things we did in your name? And he says, and then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
This is a serious thing. Now, this church doesn't belong to me. This is the Lord's church. You're the Lord's people. And the work that takes place here is the Lord's work. And we know that when the Lord works, no one can hinder it. And whatever the Lord has in store for this church, it is our prayer. It is our duty to make sure that whatever comes from this church is that which pleases the Lord. And that the word of God would be taught clearly, plainly, simply, for you to own for yourself that you might grow spiritually and know that God is with you. And if today you've realized that maybe there are some areas in your life that you need to change or repent of, then please do so today. We are living in the last days. Now is not the time to compromise your relationship with the Lord. Listen to what Proverbs says in 28, 13. It says, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And so as we move forward into what the Lord has called us in this new year to do, there is no more looking behind. No more looking back. I can't move forward into the new things that God has for me. You can't move forward into the new things that God has for you if you're constantly looking back at how bad last year was or what you've had to endure or woe is me or me. That's my violin impersonation. We spend enough of our our life looking at the difficulties and the problems and just how bad last year was. I'm over it. It's time to leave the past in the past. Leave last year where it belongs, in the dust. And in Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. And this is what I'm doing by God's grace. This is what my family is doing by God's grace. And as a church, we're committing, we're committing to you. On this anniversary date, we are committed to rebuilding and strengthening the body of Christ, namely our own church. We're looking straight ahead to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. And may the Lord establish all of our ways as we turn neither to the right nor to the left, removing our feet from evil. Let's strengthen that which remains. Let's watch for the coming of the Lord and be found faithful and be found ready when he comes back. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that you have been so gracious and merciful to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us grace upon grace, We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this new year, that we can step forward into the new things that you have planned for us before the foundations of the world. Lord, I pray over the things that were mentioned today for our new children's ministry. We pray for the right servants and volunteers and teachers to teach our kids about giving and reading the word of God and reaching out and worshiping. We pray over the men's and women's ministries. We pray over our youth ministry, Lord, just in faith asking for the right youth leader or youth pastor, Lord. We pray, God, that you would bless the men's and women's ministries, that you would bless our ushers and our greeters and our security team, those that just make people feel welcome when they come to church. Every single one of us have a, have a place where we can utilize what you've blessed us with. And so, Lord, I ask for your mercy and grace to be upon our church. I pray for us individually, as families. We would strengthen that which remains. Lord, that we would be the genuine article, that man or woman, filled with the Holy Spirit, living faith out loud. And I pray for your blessings as we conclude, Lord, Vision Sunday. Thank you, Lord, that you're the one that leads us and guides us. Thank you, Lord, that you're the one that directs your church. 
And so, Lord, we pray that you would have your perfect work accomplished and that you would do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything we could even imagine for ourselves this year. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. May the Lord bless you today. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And don't forget that after the close of our song here, we'll have our prayer teams in the designated areas available to pray for you. So God bless you and have a great rest of your Sunday.